In that case, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jonathan Johnson from the University of Texas at Austin to give our seminar today. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed UCAB. I've been there uh, one time for a conference, and it's a, it was a pretty nice department and pretty nice. Uh, in Montreal, a pretty nice city. So hopefully, I'll, I'll be there again one day. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, the biodiversity of pretzel nuts, um, and this is based off a recent paper uh, called uh, "Digital and Phenopotence: uh, Pretzel Nuts and uh, and and bio uh, and, uh, and biodiversity." Yeah. Um, so I want to start off just by telling you about you know why someone may want to study this. Uh, so here's the outline of the talk today. We're going to first just talk about some general things um, about bioavailability and nut groups, and then we're going to uh, talk about a connection to a possible connection to single branch covers, and then we're going to go to uh, the specific results that I found uh, on pretzel nuts and talk about the technique that I used to uh, get those results. So let's start off talking about bioavailability and nut groups. Uh, I guess I should start by defining a bioorder. It's a bioorder on a group G is just a total order that's invariant under both depth and multiplication. You know, and the group is uh, bioorderable if it emits a, uh, um, if it uh, emits a, a group is bioorderable if it emits a bioorder. So some examples. Um, we have three groups. Oh, man. Also, if you're uh, if G is abelian, well, this is then uh, G is biodable if and only if uh, G is torsion free. And also, uh, most surface groups are biodiverse. Uh, uh, all the ones except for uh, uh, RP2 and uh, the client bottle. So there are lots of biodiverse groups. Uh, some even come from topology. So what about for nut groups? All right. So if we have a uh, smooth nut in S3, uh, we're going to uh, look at the uh, nut complement. And the nut group is the fundamental group of the nut complement. Uh, also, just to remind you that we're going to use delta k to denote the hexagonal polynomial of a nut. And uh, as a result of Harry Short, uh, well, it follows from the result of Hall's Harry Short that uh, any knot, uh, the fundamental group of the knot complement, the knot group, uh, is always left orderable. So left orderability tries uh, to take some very interesting things well for things such as like uh, cipher fiber spaces and uh, graph manifolds. And, and left orderability is sort of this rich theory for rational homology spheres. But it turns out uh, we have positive first Betty number. Left order ability is is just doesn't do anything interesting. So uh, so nut groups are uh, three manifold groups of you know manifolds with positive first Betty number. So left order ability doesn't take interesting anything interesting here. Perhaps biodiversity does. So the big question is, for which nuts is the nut group biodiversal? So you know. Is it, uh, is it all of them? I'm going to change this scope. So consider, uh, uh, Taurus not TKL. Um, if I want to uh, get a presentation for the uh, 
that group of this tourist lot. There's a well known one where I have to have two generators and one relator. That should go away. So uh, suppose we have a buy order. Then, uh, well, you know, this group is a commutative. So we know uh, the elements A and uh, A conjugated by B are different elements. And we might as well suppose that A is less than uh, A conjugated by B. Uh, and if this is true, then since uh, by orders are invariant under left and right multiplication, they're also invariant under conjugation. So we can just, you know, conjugate both sides and get sort of a string of inequalities. And in the end, what you end up with is uh, at some point you get A conjugated by L numbers of Bs. But that's just the same as A conjugated by K numbers of A's, which is equal to A, and there's your contradiction, right? So this group is never biorderable. All right, so, so now we know that there are at least some not groups that aren't biorderable. Of course, not groups aren't biorderable. And in fact, we can do much better than this. There's a result of Edo that says, uh, if a not group is biorderable, and the uh, degree to Arizona polynomial is maximal, then you have to have at least one positive real root. In fact, you have to have at least two. All right, so this provides us lots of examples of uh, not that aren't biorderable. Uh, good way to think of it is that, you know, you know the, the complex no numbers are, in some sense, much larger than, you know, the, the real positive numbers. So you should expect most polynomials, you just get in general to, to not have uh, real positive roots. Uh, so uh, just in the same vein, like a large numbers of, of Isaiah polynomials don't have real positive roots. So, uh, and also this, uh, this condition, which is also called Rashi homogeneity fiber sometimes, is very prevalent. I think the first, like all the knots up to T Fawcett, for example, are, all satisfy this this condition. So, okay. Johnson. Yes. Uh, so compared to um, um, the result of um, Adam Clay and uh, um, Del Rosson, so the uh, Ito result does not require the knot to be fiber. That is correct. Uh, right. Well, and th th there's some connection here because you know. There's the reason it's called rationally homologically fiber. Um, so the idea is that if you, you know, this tell you something about, you know, if you're fiber, one way to think of, think of being fiber is that, you know, you have this fiber cipher surface, uh, this fibering cipher surface, and the, the maps induced on, on fundamental groups end up being isomorphism. Uh, it turns out if that map is just, um, Injective, uh, then you, you you get the same result. So this is stronger. When which paper is this? Ito's. Uh, I think it's called a biorability obstruction for Rashi homology fiber knots. I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so next question is, uh, all right, is it, is it never, <laughs> right? Well, that's, that's, that's also not true. Uh, and I'm gonna first present a, a, a condition that uh, gives examples of biodiverable uh, not groups. So we say a group is residual transfer no potent if it's, you know, the, the standard uh, definition that you may have seen before, you know, every element in the group, there's a normal subgroup with the elements not in that group, and the quotient is both torsion free and no potent, right? And from this uh, definition, oh, three groups are registered torsion free and no potent. That's going to 
be, be important in a second. And we have this nice condition that says, uh, if your commentator subgroup uh, of a not group is residual turn free nilpotent, and all the roots of the example polynomial are really positive, then we get that the not group is biordable. Uh, there's actually even a more general result in this paper, uh, but it's, it's not going to be, a more general result is not going to be important for today's talk. Uh, this theorem is actually, um, all, all the knots that we know to be biordable, all the knot groups that we know to be biordable, uh, will follow from this theorem. That all the known examples follows from this theorem. So right now, this is, this is really all we, all we have. All right. So uh, I'm going to go through a few results this, this gives us. So for example, if you look at fiber knots, fiber knots have come to the circles which are free. And uh, so if you're a fiber knot and now your roots are really positive, if you're biodorable, uh, this result technically came before the Leno, Vomtul, and Robson result. Uh, but the proof is, is basically the same. Like the, the proof of, of this, this result is basically a generalization of the proof of, of this one. And also, uh, two-bridge knots have, uh, two-bridge knot groups have uh, residual torsion phenopotent come to the subgroups. So we can say a similar thing about, uh, about the two-bridge knots. All right, so, um, so the good examples like, you know, the figure eight knot, for example, has uh, residual torsion phenopotent, uh, has biodurable uh, knot group. Uh, and also, uh, so for example, a new example from, from this theorem would be, you know, 8-3, which is just the, you know, the, the four, four uh, two-bridge knot, go like this, a uh, double-twist knot, I should say. Oh, I did that wrong. Oh, it should look like that. <laughs> All right, uh, this is actually one of a, a large family of new examples we can find using this result. Uh, so every two-bridge knot has a diagram that looks like uh, this above. Uh, and there's a result of Leovich and Murasugi that says uh, if you have your, uh, your two-bridge knot configured this way, we sort of can parameterize our knot using these, uh, these integers, these k's. And if all of those k's are positive, then as our polynomial always has uh, all real positive roots. So this gives us uh, plenty more examples of uh, knots that have vulnerable knot groups. All right, so this is sort of a nice family, right? You can sort of describe it in, in one phrase. So now we're going to take uh, a little bit of a detour into secret branch covers. So given or not, we're going to denote uh, the info uh, secret cover of S3 branched over the knot by uh, sigma nk, in standard notation. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Alfonso Zavo's uh, invariants. Uh, if you have a you know, closed connected uh, orientable B manifold. I might have forgotten adjective there. I don't know if I did or not. Um, then I'll find to find these, uh, these invariants um, uh, called Hager floor invariants. And uh, the simplest one you can define is called uh, HF hat, which is a, you know, they define it as a Z module. You can also define it as a Z mod two uh, vector space. So what the definition of that is, is, is not quite as important. What's important is that uh, if you have a rational homology sphere, uh, it's called an L space if the rank of this uh, invariant is equal to the, the number of elements in the uh, first homology. 
Uh, and I guess I should point out here that uh, this inequality is always true. Uh, so this is sort of the, the minimum uh, rank that uh, Hager, uh, the Hager for margin can, uh, can have. And it gets its name from uh, lens spaces, because lens spaces, uh, uh, this is true for lens spaces. Lens spaces are L spaces. All right. So, important result is that if you have a two bridge knot, uh, parent provides just as we did before, and all those KIs are positive, then we know that the secret branch coverage of K is an L space for all the positive energies in. Um, in a quick sketch of this, uh, is that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do pretty much any of the details, but the, the idea is that uh, you can find some sort of rotational symmetry, this 180 degree rotational symmetry, and you can uh, you can see that uh, uh, K uh, uh, oh yeah. You can see that um, there's an uh, there's an unknot, which they're going to call uh, U one, uh, uh, such that um, if I think of that, there's a rotational, there's a hundred eighty uh, degree rotational symmetry. Uh, of, of S3, uh, which uh, uh, fixes the not K. That's what's important. All right, and that and because of that, we can uh, quotient S3 by this uh, rotational symmetry, rotational symmetry around its axis uh, U1, and we get some new not new two, right? We get a uh, U2 from K, and this is always a knot. Um, and so we get uh, a diagram sort of like this, I'll do it to the side here. So we have uh, an, an S3, because if you, you know, if you, if you coach it, S3 uh, by the rotational symmetry, you, you get S3 again, and you also get this uh, these two unknots, and we know that it's sort of double covered. I call this uh, sigma uh, no, I won't do this. Sometimes, there we go. Sometimes you just need more paper. All right. So uh, the picture that we have here, uh, this, this is great. All right, we have X3 and these two one knots, U1 and U2. And this is sort of a, I'm going to write this, let's see. I want to do the two-fold branch cover of U1. And not, not rather U2. And I what I get in that case is I get S3 again, because you know the branch cover over over I'm not is always going to give you S3. Uh, U1 is going to stay the same, uh, but U2 becomes or not K. Then I can follow that up by doing an infold uh, cover uh, over the over the second uh, 
the second unknot. So do the two-fold cover, then the infold cover. Um, and that course, of course, is just going to be the info cover of K. Alternatively, we could have just done a uh, first uh, info cover of U2. And again, this is going to be S3. And U1 is going to lift to some not J. We, you know, we don't. Uh, we're still going to have an unknot uh, U2. And then we can do a two-fold cover after that and get the same thing. But now we know that this is also a two-fold cover of whatever this not J is. And the, the long and short of it is that uh, J is alternating. And so uh, by uh, Oswald and Zabo, uh, we know that this is an L space. That's the, that's the, the long and short of how the proof works. So this is nice. Let's go back to this, this theorem. Because uh, this is the same set, it's the same example that we saw before when we talked about bioorderability. Uh, to make things more interesting, uh, it's a theorem of, uh, of Gordon that if you're a tuberish knot, uh, with uh, zero uh, signature, then there's some secret branch cover. Well, for insufficiently large, your secret branch covers will always have left audible fundamental group. Uh, uh, you mean the signature non zero? Yes. Wait. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. And all knots known to have vulnerable uh, knot group always have Isaiah polynomial with all real roots. So all known examples um, have signature zero. And uh, in light of, uh, you know, this is part of the L-space conjecture. Uh, so being in L-space should correspond to uh, not being left orderable. Um, this tells you that all our, our, our known examples um, um, don't fall into this category, right? So, uh, so, so far, this gives us more evidence that there's this connection between these properties of the cyclic branch covers and biodurability that seems to be uh, overlapping uh, some. And, and the reason why this is important is that both of these properties are very rare. It's very rare to find a knot that has biodurable knot group. Uh, most knots, you just expect to just not be biodurable. And also, it's very rare to find a manifold, uh, a, a knot whose cyclic branch covers are all L spaces um, and are never left audible. Um, so when these line up, even on you know, and, and there's actually multiple things when this lines up, it makes you think that there's gotta be something going on here. So this motivated uh, this conjecture, which says that uh, if a knot group is biodurable, uh, perhaps this is only true precisely when uh, all the secret bunch covers uh, are L spaces. And of course, in light of the L space conjecture, this would have other analogous conjectures to it, right? You can also talk about this in terms of Left or not being left orderable and um, and uh, not having a uh, coordinable top foliation. All right, so now let's talk about pretzel knots. Right, those are in the title, so I should talk about them at some point. All right, so let's consider the, the genus one pretzel knot, uh, parameterized by P, Q, and R this way. And we're going to assume that, uh, that one is less than Q and less than R. And this is because if you permute current parameters, you, you, get the, uh, you, you get the same knot. And also, if you reverse the sign of all the parameters, uh, you get the same knot up to mirroring. And of course, uh, biodurability uh, 
that doesn't care about mirroring at all. So we might as well just assume that Q and R are positive. Uh, I also want to point out that if any of these parameters is uh, plus or minus one, then this knot is a two bridge knot. And two bridge knots, uh, we already know they have zigi torsion free and opponent come to the subgroups. Um, and in fact, these are all going to be genus one. So they're either going to have uh, two real roots, two real positive roots even, or no real roots. And so um, it, there's nothing more we can say about, uh, about the, these examples all determined already. We already know the borderability of all these examples. So we might as well not focus on those. So I might as well just, you know, go ahead and spoil the ending. Uh, so the question is, when do these things have position torsion free and opponent come to the subgroups? Because as I said before, then we, we kind of you know what to do from there. Uh, and it turns out if the mean coefficient is applying power, uh, which is required for this uh, specific method uh, based on the paper on Maiden that we'll talk about later, then we know that the commentary subgroup of, uh, of a GS1 pretzel knot is rigid torsion free and opotent uh, if one of these conditions hold. Uh, and I'll let you guys read through those. I want to read them all myself. But I will make a few comments. Uh, this first part actually uh, this follows from uh, work of uh, Malian and, and Rurosugi uh, way back in the 70s. They were actually want, they didn't actually care about residual torsion free nilpotent. Uh, they, they cared about uh, residual finiteness, right? So Malian and, Rur and Malian in particular did a lot of work in trying to show that not for residually finite. And, in, and to do this, he was showing that the commutative subgroups of these nut groups um, were residually P groups. And then, you know, by other methods, we, we now know that nut groups are residually finite. And so all this research should just sort of, just sort of stop. <laughs> and, you know, but it turns out that these, uh, the, these techniques give us these, these results, these new results about a different problem. So that's nice. Um, I also want to point out that uh, these exceptions that I have here, are these sort of exceptions, the methods that I used uh, in order to get these results just do not, they don't work for the, these exceptions, right? So it's not just that, you know, there's some way you can use these techniques to prove these. You got to find a different completely technique than I use if you want to get results about these examples. All right. Uh, I want to talk about a few particular examples. Uh, uh, so if you have a uh, gen th th this genus one uh, pretzel knot, well, we can tell you exact exactly what the Isaiah polynomial is. It's going to be a quadratic. And uh, it's this thing right here. You can read it. And this parameter n is just based off of you know, this matrix which basically comes from a cipher matrix. And quadratics are easy. You know, we learned how to solve those way back in, in high school, right? And so uh, I can tell you now that uh, when, when n is, is positive, then this as our polynomial has no real roots. So then we can use Edo to abstract it. Because uh, these are all genus one. So, uh, if n, is, yeah. So if n is not zero, then it's not going to be a trivial not a trivial Alexander polynomial. So, so these all have maximal degree Alexander polynomials. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so in other words, you know, th this gives us not biodable. When n is negative, then Alexander polynomial has two real roots, which is nice because then whether it's biodable or not depends precisely on when the come to the subgroup is, is residually torsion free nilpotent. And when n is zero, the Alexander polynomial is trivial. And I want to point out that when the Alexander polynomial of a knot is trivial, then the come to the subgroup uh, can never be residually torsion free nilpotent. Uh, and, uh, and this is because uh, you can use the Alexander polynom polynomial uh, to show that the come to the subgroup in this case would be uh, perfect. 
actually. And perfect groups are never residually nilpotent, so they can't be residually tortured nilpotent. All right, so, so this means that if we, if it, if we have trivial accidental polynomial, then you know, the, the previous theorem that we use to, to show variability, it just doesn't apply. So we, we got to find a whole new way of showing variability of, uh, of a knot group in order to, to handle those examples. All right, so we can apply this to our results above and we get this nice table. Um, ah, yes. And this notation here, this is just the, the leading coefficient of the identical polynomial. And this should be a K. So in particular, I want to point out that this family here, in a, a recent paper, it was shown that for this family, that uh, all the single branch covers uh, of, of those nuts uh, are L spaces. So it's just shown in a recent paper by uh, uh, Amadissa and Hannah Turner. Okay. So how are we doing so far? Good. So I'll go over a couple of other uh, results. Oh yeah, this is really important. So if we have this knot JQ, which I'm going to define to be uh, this particular pretzel knot for each integer Q, was that's at least three. Then for infinitely many of these JQs, we're going to get that the, uh, the knot group is biortable. And this is very interesting uh, because uh, for all of these examples, um, the cyclic branch cover is not a nail space and is not left orderable. And, and no, my, my bad, it's not a nail space and the fundamental groups of the, of the double branch covers is left notable, uh, which results of Eisenberg, Hitch, and Newman, and, and Jenkins and Newman, and Jenkins and Newman. Uh, and this is, uh, and what this means is that if you remember the conjecture from earlier, it means that the forward direction here is, is actually false, right? You know. However, uh, uh, the, the backwards uh, direction is still open. And um, none, of the, no, none of the examples uh, from genus one pretzel knots are, are going to find a counter example, even the ones that I didn't figure out. Um, uh, are, I mean, I'm probably not going to find a counter example, I should say. I would also like to point out one more result, uh, which we can also have, you know, there's also personal knots of, that aren't genus one. And here's a nice infinite family of uh, personal knots of arbitrarily high genus. And, uh, and each of these personal knots also has a variable uh, knot group. Now, as you start to, uh, and all these results, the, the tricky part of showing these for infinite families is that it's hard to know what happens to the Alexander polynomial. Uh, so it's probably going to be lots of examples like this where you can see things that are biorderable. But you know, if these things are like not three or if they're not alternating counseling out, 
then the Azure polynomial just starts to get harder to figure out and you know and, and more complicated. So that's the reason why you don't you don't see more of these uh, um, higher genus uh, examples here, right? You just got to do a little more work to understand the Azure polynomials, which I didn't do, but I'm sure someone could do it. All right, I want to talk a little bit about how I got these examples. So I've talked a little bit about this, uh, this, this, you know, this technique from Malin. And this is basically how it works. So you start off with the minimal genus cipher surface. Uh, and we're going to assume that this is unknotted, which just means that the uh, fundamental group of the complement of the surface is free. And so the idea here is that, you know, uh, you have some knot. I'm just going to draw the young knot so it doesn't get too, too complicated. And uh, perhaps you have your cipher surface here. Then you get this natural inclusion of, uh, you get this natural inclusion of uh, the fundamental group of the, the cipher surface into the, uh, Subsurface complement just by pushing off in either direction. Say that's the positive direction. And you can also push it off in the negative direction. And there's a little bit of festival base points, which I'm not going to go over. Uh, but that's a way you can you know, make this precise. So, um, so we're going to define by h plus and h minus to be the images of these maps uh, i plus and i minus. Um, so important things to, to point out here is that uh, these groups are going to be free groups of the same rank. Right? So uh, these are just, uh, and uh, this is just an embedding of a, uh, it's an embedding of a, you know, free rank of some rank uh, 2G, you know, embedding into some other free group of rank 2G, right? <laughs> That's what's going on. That's what these things are doing. And we know this is embedding because it's uh, minimal genus. All right. So uh, important definition here. Uh, we say that, so you have a free group, a free factor of a free group is just something that you can free product with something else to get the whole group. Uh, it's equivalent to saying that, you know, if I start with some subgroup of a free group, it has some free basis, and if I can extend that free basis to a free basis of the entire group, that's, that's the same thing of saying that it's just a free factor. And using this terminology, we can now, uh, uh, you can now find a sufficient condition for a uh, for the uh, commutator subgroup uh, to be residually torsion free nilpotent, and this is uh, due to uh, due to Malin and oh and Bump's log. I combined some some, some uh, theorems together. So uh, so if I have a cipher surface uh, S, uh, you know I can look at uh, H plus. This is you know some free group, some free subgroup. Uh, and it's going to be sitting inside, you know, H plus times the commutator subgroup of uh, the cipher surface complement. And I can ask whether that's a free factor. I can do the same thing with H minus. And if there's true for both of them, then I say that S satisfies the free factor property. And if I uh, have a knot, and that's the case, and also we have that the uh, degree to Isaiah polynomial is maximal, and the leading coefficient of the Isaiah polynomial is a prime power, then we get that the commutator subgroup is a uh, residual charge free and no potent. So this is going to be the, uh, the, the tool that we're going to use to sort of investigate these examples. And so once you do that, then you start doing the hard work, right? You uh, you know, if you have a, uh, as a matter of fact, if you have any pretzel knot 
where all the parameters are odd, and you have an odd number of parameters, uh, you have this nice unknotted minimal genus cipher surface just sitting here. Uh, And of course, you know, the uh, fundamental group of the cipher surface itself, this is just generated by, you know, X and Y from this picture. And the cipher surface of the, uh, and the fundamental group of the cipher surface complement is generated by A and B as drawn in this picture. Uh, and then, uh, as you want to get uh, representations of what H plus and H minus look like using uh, these choices, where they, they look like this. So H plus is just the group generated by these uh, these two elements, and H minus is the uh, subgroup generated by these two elements. All right. So with that done, let's say I actually wanted to check to see if one of these guys um, has a digitally tortured phenotypic potent come to the subgroup. What do I do? Well, you first want to check to make sure that the Isaiah polynomial has a maximal degree, uh, which is easy, right? Because uh, this is true if and only if you know the n equals zero. Uh, and just to remind you what. Uh, and it is this guy here. So that's 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 the easy thing to check. <laughs> you also have to check that the leading coefficient is a prime power. Um, this one is easy to do for a specific example, but can be tricky to do for infinite families, right? Because then you start just getting to, to number theory and prime numbers, and you know, those can get really hard. And uh, this is part of the reason why it's actually really hard to uh, generalize this result to just all genus one petal knots. This is part of the reason. Uh, the other part is this this other this last part here, which is where most of the work is. Uh, seeing that these two subgroups are free factors, seeing that you know this subsurface S satisfies the free factor property. Uh, and the reason why is that each proof really depends on the arithmetic properties of this P, Q, and R, you know? And so as you try to do it more generally, you know, you end up having to show like an infinite number of cases to be able to prove it, which even, you know, I can't do that. I think it would probably be very hard for, for, for most people to, to do an infinite number of proofs. So what, what do you mean by the arithmetic properties of P, Q, and R? So like, um, if you, uh, so for example, uh, if you wanted to prove it for the, uh, the pretzel knots, these ones here, right? Uh, there is a proof for when R is even, and then there's a proof for when R is odd, right? And you, you gotta have to do these as separate cases, right? Uh, and if you look at when P is like minus five, this is a, a, a another one that I did. Uh, it depends on like, you know, what is, you have to ask yourself, you know, like something like what is Q, uh, like mod, three and, you know, and then what is R mod something else, right? And so, there's no like general way to do this for like just a arbitrary integers. It always depends on you know what these guys are you know modular of each other, right? If they're all relatively prime, you're gonna get cert one proof. Uh, if they're not relatively prime, you gotta do something a little different. And that, that's what, and that's kind of what I mean, right? So that's what I mean by arithmetic properties. Does that make sense? So uh, let's see what time is it. Uh, so how, how does it work in this seminar? Is it usually uh, is it like 50 minutes or do you always go to the hour? How does it work here? So we're sort of aiming if possible to on the slightly shorter side, but 
sort of. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, I want to do uh, one more thing. Uh, huh, that's what I'll do. Oh, I want to do a couple examples, but for the sake of time, I think I, I'd rather go to these charts. So I had these films before, which are just sort of a bunch of statements. Uh, but I think these, are uh, oh, the trust didn't show up. All right. That's what I'll do. All right, so here are the charts. So you can sort of put this in chart form, which is a little easier to, to digest. Uh, so if, so the idea is that every cell is, you know, going to be one of the person that we care about, like this one is going to be P. So all of these on this page are minus three, and the Q value of this one is three, and this one, the R value is 11. All right, and the things that we want to know, we want to know like what is N, and in this case, N is going to be minus two. Uh, and we want to know if it satisfies the t-factor property or not, that surface surface. And if it's green, then it's yes. And if it's red, then it's no, right? Uh, so this is sort of how you summarize the results. Uh, so remember, to be biorable, n has to be less than uh, zero, right? So, so these guys are a nice biorable family. Uh, you have a negative n, it's a prime power, and they satisfy the feedfactor property. Uh, these guys, they do satisfy the feedfactor property. Um, so if n is a prime power, we know they have residual charge feed your potent compared to subgroups, but these are, all of these guys are never biodible, right? And these red guys, uh, we don't know if it satisfies the feedfactor property or not. Uh, and I also mentioned, you know, when n is zero, it has trivial as general polynomial. So I, I don't, I didn't really check for those cases. All right. So, so for all the uh, minus three, uh, you know, uh, minus three qr pretzel knots, you know, we have we have these results. And I also did the same thing for the uh, the uh, minus five case, which looks like this. So something that is interesting to, just to point out um, is that most of these guys you can always resolve for a particular, you know, minus p, we'll say. There's always a few sporadic examples here, like around the middle, where it doesn't always work out. And uh, and it seems to have some sort of bound relative to the end, right? Uh, so, so there is some sort of sort of pattern you can sort of look at there that you might try to work with. So I did all the minus threes and minus fives, and I stopped there because it just gets more complicated the higher up you go, and you can't really generalize the proof uh, as well. But you do get a lot of new examples of uh, of bottom knots from from this. Uh, from this work. And I think that's why I'm gonna leave it off for today. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Jonathan. I'll up awkwardly. Um, so, well, does anyone have any, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. So, do you have uh, a heuristic understanding of why, if you have an odd olive whose branch coverage have non left vertebral fundamental group, that that might have something to do with the bioorderability of the knot group? Uh, not particularly. It's interesting. I actually, the direction that felt like more obtainable was actually the other direction, which tried to be false, right? There's I mean, it, you know, it, it, it has something to do with these uh, these secret covers, right? So I guess I should say that, you know, if a knot is biodable, then we know that if I look at the secret covers, those all are gonna have, uh, 
biodegradable fundamental groups, right? Uh, and the branch cover is just a quotient of these, uh, or the, the, the fundamental groups of the branch covers are just quotients of the uh, fundamental groups of these secret covers. And uh, so my, my guess is that somehow the, uh, the, the left orders on these secret covers are playing, are playing with the bioordability somehow. And, uh, and somehow maybe being bioordable or not can influence whether you have a left order where this thing you question out by ends up being what they call convex, right? Which was gives you left orderability on the, uh, on the uh, branch secret cover. So the table is something there, and and that and that has been uh, results that show that bioavailability does affect what types of left orders you can have on a group. So there is there is a reason why that that can you might might believe that that should be related somehow. Um, can you say something quick? I mean, what what are the restrictions on the left orders of a bioavailable group? Um, well, if you're biodegradable, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this action you can define on the left orders. Uh, uh, and this action ends up being, I think it's like transitive or something like that. I can't remember exactly the statement. So basically, uh, in some sense, it's kind of opposite of what you want. If you have a biodegradable group, you have lots of left orders. I see. Yeah. Okay. And do you have any, I mean, you've proved that a lot of these things are left orderable, sorry, biorderable subject to, I guess, you know, things like this prime cover condition. Do you have any idea about how essential that condition is? Ah, yes. So I expect it's not essential. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason why is that the technique I used here, uh, it, it was used Somewhere in the proof in Mayland, you have to show something is like residually a uh, finite P group. And we know that uh, P groups are neopotent, and that's kind of where it, it becomes important. Uh, but if you look at, say, the two bridge knot paper that, 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 I, that I wrote, I used just a different technique. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that technique just didn't use the prime power condition, and mm -hmm. everything was fine, right? So I, I expect that this, this condition is. Uh, uh, the prime power condition is more important for the technique used here than it is for uh, the results in general. Okay, so you probably think that even when you don't have a prime power, they might still be biorderable. You just can't yeah. prove it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, can you first remind me, like, uh, um, which direction has counterexample? I've I um, the all the secret branch cover is left orderable, right? And the uh, I one X is uh, bi orderable. Um, which which direction you guys have a counterexample? Yeah. So bi orderable does not imply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Bi orderable does bi orderable does not imply. This is L space or not left orderable. Yeah, yeah, or not left orderable, right? Oh, yeah. okay. oh thank you. Uh, and also, um, you mentioned earlier um, this uh, Ito's uh, obstruction um, by orderability. Um, do you see how, like, is it possible to relax the condition on the Alexander polynomial? Um, so, if you think about what it's doing, so residually, resi uh, not residual, what I'm trying to say. You say a degree. So the instruction, what it's doing is it's looking at uh, an action on the uh, commutator subgroup. That's, that's kind of what, you, what you're doing. And what you want to say is that, okay, well, if you're biorderable, then you have this, you know, action on a commutator subgroup. Uh, and we can like, uh, and we can like build up this sort of subgroup of it, you know, where you get some sort of contradiction, you know. And if you try to relax it, uh, it doesn't work. 
I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. Ah, it relies on this construction where you're like taking copies of a Cypress Texas supplement and gluing them together. Uh -huh. Right? Uh -huh. And you want this to tell you things about the commentator subgroup. And what this condition in, uh, tell, uh, what this condition guarantees is that at the level of fundamental group, these things actually embed into the infant secret cover. That's what's going on, right? Uh, you want these to embed on the level of fundamental group. Because they embed, then, you know, if the, fun, if the, if the competitor subgroup is like biodable, then we know things about uh, what's going on on like these really small guys, which we can handle. Small guys are easier to, to, to analyze. Wait, but can you all? This doesn't happen when, uh, yes? But that's a cipher surface, right? You can always make it incompressible. Um, Sorry, maybe I misunderstood. What do you mean by embed inside the sticky branch cup? I mean, like, um, It's okay if you don't remember how you put yeah, it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's not your result anyway. I was just, <laughs> I was just yeah. Uh, do you know if it's like possible to relax that condition? Or do we expect that, like, uh, you know, if it's biodegradable, then you should have some. Do you have a like, counterexample? You have like a biodegradable, um, not group, but the exam polynomial is not like maximum degree, or I don't know, like. Um, not for things that are like uh, hyperbolic. Uh, oh wait, you mean all the? You can do some. You can do some superficial things with satellites to 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 get this situation, but I see. But not for hyperbolic knots. For hyperbolic knots, the only things the only knots we know things about is when the as our polynomial is maximal. Okay, I see. And I didn't say it well, but what it comes down to is that you're losing information about the commentator subgroup uh, um, when uh, when uh, when, is, when this condition is not satisfied. For example, in particular extreme case, if the Azar polynomial is trivial, then it's in some sense the Azar polynomial is not telling you anything about what's really going on on the level of commentator subgroup. Right. right? And that's kind of the, the idea. That's extreme. <laughs> that's extreme. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> OK. Uh, we, we even have like example of like a slice knot being like a that biodegradable, kind of bi 